Podcast One is your one-stop shop for everything TV and pop culture. A very candid, not even supposed to be on the record conversation. Check out any of the Collider Network podcasts like TV Talk, Movie Talk, Collider Live, and more. And for you reality TV fans, Rob's sister Nino's got you covered with Rob has a podcast. This is a podcast There's no about substance. nothing. <laughs> yeah. You literally have a podcast about nothing. Check out the Collider Network and Rob has a podcast every week on Podcast One or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Pluto. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the Schmodown Rundown. Intro two things first. Frankie Stan Janet and the host of the Schmodown Rundown, Brad Gilmore. What's up, movie trivia Schmodown fans? Welcome to the Schmodown. Rundown, the official after show for the movie trivia showdown. My name is Brad Gilmore in Houston, Texas. We are joined today with a very special guest. His name is Frank Janish. Frank, thanks for being the special guest this week. Thanks for having me, a uh, longtime listener, a big time fan. I just uh, first time real caller. honor. <laughs> yeah, a real honor to be here. Thanks, thank you so much. Why was that ever a thing where people would be like, long time listener, first time caller? <laughs> what what was I, yeah. the point in saying that? It's like, so you never thought anything was interesting enough that we were talking about before to call in about? Thanks for, thanks for insulting me, by it's the way. It's almost like the, the beginning of, of like a dating profile, it sounds like. You know? <laughs> it does. <laughs> Long time listener, first time caller, first time swiper. Yeah, uh, first time swiper. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand it, but also, he doesn't want me to throw to him, but over there in, the, in Pennsylvania, our man Chris Clark is still recovering from an illness. If he wants to say something, he can't. I can. You good? Yeah, this is fine, guys. Uh, you know what? This week is so exciting, especially for the live event that was just announced. Let's rock this sucker, Brad, as always. Let's rock this to the end of time. That's right. That's right. Well, that is Chris Clark over there in Pennsylvania. Um, let's talk about it. He spoiled it. You know, he uh, he he didn't bury the headline, you know, but he he definitely spoiled it for everybody out there. If you are living under a rock or you haven't been on lawn because you've been stuffing your face full of turkey leftovers all week. Let's catch you up a little bit. There was a major announcement made by Christian Harloff, the commissioner of the movie Trivia Schmodown or the the figurehead of the movie Trivia Schmodown, the league. He, uh, we, he was teasing us for quite a while, Frank, and we knew last week when we spoke that there was going to be a live event January the 26th. We did not know where. Um, we did not know geographically where, what venue or anything, or when tickets would be announced or when anything would, more would be announced. But now we have the announcement. The announcement has been announced. And January the 26th, Schmodown Live, the season premiere for next season, will be going down in New York City, New York. More specifically, my favorite of the five boroughs, home to Jay-Z and the notorious B.I.G., a Brooklyn in the house, BK all day. Um, it's going to be in Brooklyn, full screen live, schmodownlive.com. You can get tickets. I'm excited for it. And guess what, Frank? Let's let's spoil something else since we're in the mood of spoiling. I'm going to sp- make a major spoiler right now about the New York live event for the movie trivia Schmodown. Christian, don't kill me, but I think Frank and I are going to be there. We're going to be there. I think, I think, I think we're going to be there. <laughs> yes, I think. Yes. Yeah, and Spoiler we're gonna, alert. And we're we gonna shall do be in a, New York. We're going to do a rundown episode in Times Square. Uh, yes. Right in the middle. Standing yep. there in be, the middle yeah. of Times Square. Mm-hmm, going to do uh, it. I, yeah. th- why not? <laughs> YOLO, right? Um, I think we're going to do that. But yeah. We don't know who's going to participate, but we know there's some to-be-determined versus to-be-determined matches on the card. Right. Um, expound a little bit about it, Frank. What What else do you know about the live event oh, going down? Oh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, well, we don't know the undercard, but we do know the main event is uh, the singles title. It will be on the line, uh, whether it's John Roca or somebody else defending the belt at Spectacular or at the live event after Spectacular. And then the number one contender, which will be decided at Spectacular, will then challenge the current champ in New York, for the title. Uh, and that's how we're kicking off uh, 2019. 
2019. It's incredible. Let's talk about what that means, though, for the Schmodown. To, to do a live event not in their backyard anymore. Not in Los Angeles, California. Not from Collider Live. Not at the El Portal Theater. We're going to New York City, New York. It just shows you how much the game has grown. How much the league has grown. And I think how much the powers that be believe in the league. To, to do it in another city, this is this is a massive deal. And this isn't just like we're driving up to San Francisco or we're going to, you know, Orange County. This is New York. This is the other coast. This yeah. is like three hours you're losing in the air. Um, not just two for you and I, Frank. This is three hours for them coming from coast to coast. I think this is a massive thing for the league. I think that it shows... One, the nationwide, we already knew that there's fans all across the nation, all across the world, but fans nationwide and to have enough fans in these major markets to go travel to only does better for the movie trivia Schmodown. I even saw on the Schmodown Facebook group, there's somebody who's already booked his ticket coming from the United Kingdom, jolly yeah. old London town. I don't know exactly if that's where he's coming from, but I'm just assuming that everyone's from London or from England for that matter. Um, but he's coming from the UK to come to the live event. I think it's just awesome. I'm excited about New York City. I think New York's going to bring a different vibe. You know, it's going to bring a different vibe to the game. If you're a little yeah. bit meaner, it's going to bring out that meanness in you. You know what I mean? And it's going to be <laughs> it's going to you know? be in the winter as well Ooh, whereas weather. the past few have been in nice weather in la and everyone has a great time standing in line outside you know you've seen the lines in the videos uh, around the block and uh you know the good thing though here is that christian mentioned that this show so far is selling very very well in its first couple of days um a little bit better than how la has sold so that's very encour encouraging to hear that uh, the new york fan base the surrounding area at least or um, East Coast folks, Midwest folks are, are flying or traveling to New York to see this event because Christian says, you know, I don't know when we might do another one on the East Coast. So this might be the one, only one we get considering how the Schmodown is going to be changing uh, next season. We don't know if those changes are going to work out. It's going to be for the better or the worst. But, I mean, I think they're going to be for the better overall. But uh, you never know what can happen. So this may be your one shot. And I think people are fully hopping on board and taking that to heart, knowing that this is their one shot to see a showdown live uh, and, uh, you know, doing it in New York, Christian's uh, hometown. Uh, so, you know, you got to go out and support. Yeah, I just hope that it doesn't smell bad out there. You know, that's my biggest concern about New York City. You know, I mean, they already have the Yankees, which is just, you know, real, you know, real classic organization. You know, Ooh. the Giants. You know, what have they ever done? What are, they, what are the Yankees ever done? You know what I mean? When's the last time they won the World Series? Oh, yeah, that's right. Like a decade ago. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop crapping on New York. That was just for Christian. Because, um, you know, last year when the when the Astros and the Yankees were in that ALCS, he, he you know, he talked so much smack to me. He was like, oh, they're going to lose. The Astros are going to lose. It's going to go to game seven. And then I think he was picking the Dodgers after that. You know, he really hurt my heart there, and I haven't let it go. So if I have a chance to crap on his hometown, I'm just going to take that chance. But I think that's going to be awesome. Chris, I know that you're, you're still a horse. You sound like you've swallowed 10 frogs. But just tell us, because New York is your backyard as well. You're just a hop, skip, and a jump away. How excited are you for the live event to be right there? You don't have to fly to L.A., baby. You're just hopping on that train. I'm hopping on the 90-minute uh, train to New York, and I'm pretty much there at Penn Station, and all it is just a short little train ride to Brooklyn. It's going to be fantastic, but the only other thing I have to say is that the reason why the tickets are probably selling even better than they are in L.A. is due to the transportation. If you've ever been in New York City, it's easy to get from point A to point B in a certain amount of time. As much as L.A. is beautiful and it's great, Getting from point A to point B requires renting a car, getting someplace from getting to from going to like uh, West Hollywood to North Hollywood is not as easy as going from Brooklyn to Manhattan. And I feel like the ease of transportation in New York City is going to help this grow so, so much that I, I think by next episode, it will probably be sold out with the rate that they're selling these tickets is going to be phenomenal and the crowd there is just going to be so so enthralling so i'm super excited for new york city especially the environment i think it's going to fit the schmodown quite nicely 
Another yeah. thing that I heard Christian real quick talk about, saying that uh, you know, right now this is the only live event they have on the book so far with full screen. Who puts on these events? So you definitely gotta show the the enthusiasm here by selling this thing out early quickly, and that sh- that'll help show that uh, the showdown has legs for possibly other cities, if not at least back again in L.A. Uh, with full screen and everything that entails with that. I think, I think it. I'm gonna make a bold prediction here. I think that if they are able to sell this thing out within, you know, before December. If they're able to sell it out before December, I think we'll see three additional live events next year, um, one in every quarter. I think we're going to have another in L.A. I think we have one in Chi-Town. And then we, we do the spectacular live in H-Town. That's what I say <laughs> we do. You know what I mean? And I think that everyone would really appreciate doing it in Houston. You know, I think that makes sense for everyone. But in all honesty, I think... That I agree with you, Chris. That I saw how enthusiastic people seem to be that it's on the East Coast. There's so many members of the Schmodown community that are on the East Coast, including our own Aaron Turner. He's down there in Florida, but that's still on the East Coast. You know, it's 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 not too bad of a plane ride to get up to New York City. So I think that it's going to sell out, no doubt. And it's just a matter of how quickly it does sell out. And I'm excited to see. Who is going to be the champion going into that live event? Because I think that's going to also dictate. Here's the thing, though. For it to sell out before anything's announced would be awesome. But a great bump if ticket sales, you know, if they just have a few left, is going to be whoever walks into New York City as the champion and how excited that makes the Schmodown community. Right now, the champs, John Roca. There's a singles tournament this week. We're about to get into the first uh, a couple of uh, big matches that we're seeing that, that we talked about last week, Frank, as far as big uh, bracket busters. I think we're done here today uh, for for this week for the Schmodown. And I think that... Um, I'm I'm excited to talk more about the singles tournament to see who the champion is going to be. But let me say this. Before we get there, before I ramble on anymore, before I say I think one more time, Frank, I want to talk about TriviaSD.com. Because TriviaSD.com has had a lot of cool stories going up as of late. And you had one that went up this week um, of Schmodown stats that might surprise you. Is that, yeah. is that, is that correct? Yeah, I, I read through it. There were some very interesting things there. Uh, I know Christian had a, a had an interesting stat. Roca was on there. Um, for you researching that, tell the people one what it was all about and what was your most interesting stat. Uh, so it was a stat or an article about stats that you might not think about necessarily. That's all in your mind all the time. You know, not like about little like wins and losses. Like right, right. Not happened. wins or losses necessarily. About performances, little things that happen within the match or at least that happen in matches over a period of time. Um, one of those you brought up with Christian, he had a run of six matches in a row where he answered four for four in the second round. Um, and he had a really good streak, uh, during that. That was like part of his revenge tour ish kind of thing. And, uh, that was one of the more, was that him um, going into the championship? It was, it ended at the Bibiani, um, match. So then it was Snyder after that. And then it, then it was, uh, against, Merle after that so um it was just 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 before that um and then some other yeah it was really fun to just kind of go through the numbers everything that I everything that I have recorded and kind of fish through it and see what was popping up and I had some ideas about a couple things for the article but then the one that really just kind of caught me by surprise was uh, about John Roca and him using multiple choice and the last 13 times he went to multiple choice, he's gotten it correct every um, time, right? Every yeah, time that, that was thirteen crazy for one thirteen, thirteen yeah. for thirteen, and he's thirteen of fourteen overall, which means he missed his first attempt at multiple choice, which was against Josh McCuga back in his second match in the Collider era. So uh, to be thirteen of thirteen using multiple choice, um, that's and that's over. I th- that, I think that was over. How many matches? A lot. Or 16, 14 matches, I think it was. Something like that. Um, Who's the yeah, most he, tenor yeah. competitor? Who's played the most matches? Right now, it's between Makuga. Uh, or right now, it's actually just Josh Makuga. He has 18 matches in singles. I mean, within all the leagues, I don't know off the top of my head. It might be John Roca because come spectacular, his defense there, he'll have 18 singles matches. And then he's got like another 10 or 11 with top 10, and then he's got a couple more with Founding Fathers. So, 
He's God, up there. Man. JTE's yeah. also really up there too. He's got like 17 singles. Then he's got the 17 11... singles. Yeah, 17. Wow. Singles. That doesn't yeah. even sound right for him. Yeah. You think of him as really that's weird for JT to have that many He's matches, 8 and 9. You, you think of him as a singles. You I mean, you think of him as a team. Yeah. You know, guy. You don't think of him as a singles. You got to remember oh, also in the 2017 he went through the tournament was in the tournament final. Um, right, 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 so, right, right. And then before that, he had in the 2014 tournament he had a nice run there to get to the uh semifinal against Mark Riley. So he had three, but he was also in the very first match. So he had four in the first year and then then he had that crazy 2015 year where he was just getting, where he was just losing, <laughs> just all right. the time. Cody all Miller time. to, you know. But then he, yeah, he has. He's had a crazy singles career. So one more thing before we get to um, the matches that were this week, I wanted to talk about this upcoming uh, movie release dates match that they have. So. Let me know if I get anything wrong, but it's an exhibition match. It's going to be mm-hmm. patron only, and it's going to be Adam Lavick, S- Sam Levine, Ben Bateman, and Scott Mance. Uh, all movie release dates. Iron Man match. Winner gets their is is that a thing? Is the winner get the face on the slice, or did I make that up? I don't know. I, I think know I may have made that up. You might might have. Yeah. I think it was. I just assumed that from the promo because they're like, you want. You want your face? <laughs> yeah. On my slice? That's my. Uh, that's yeah, it's good. Not bad. Is it good? Is it? Is, yeah, I think it's. it's uh, yeah, I've heard sorry, better, but it, you know, it's not bad. You want Cameron Diaz? <laughs> you okay? Anyway, I'm sorry. Um, but I, who do you got in that one? Because I've thought about this long and hard. Adam Lavic, I don't know. You know, I think that in an Iron Man setting, I don't. I don't see him having it. I don't think he's got the stamina. I, don't, I just don't think he's got the stamina. To do it. This is just my, you know, interpretation. Um, I think that Sam Levine or Ben Bateman will take the cake. Because for me, Mance is very good. Obviously, we know him as a movie release dates guy. I think he's got a dark spot. I think the newer films, you know, like maybe 2000s on, like maybe mid-2000s on, He's not as dead accurate as he has with, you know, if you say, you know, when was Back to the Future 2 related? 1989! You know, and he knows it like December the 17th. You know, he knows it off the top <laughs> right. of his head. Um, that's not the right date, by the way, because I don't know it. But I, I think that he's going to lack. So I think the real competition is going to be between Ben Bateman and Sam Levine. And here's the thing. I think Sam, the inglorious one, Levine, is not coming out of, well, it's not coming out of retirement. But I don't think he's going to compete in an exhibition in the movie Trivia Schmodown, if he is not very extremely confident that he is going to win. And he's got to come back, and he's got to feel that. You know, he's got to make people feel that I'm still the best at this game. I'm still maybe one of the GOATs, if not the GOAT of the game. I think Sam Levine wins this one. Oh, I'm sorry, Ben. Ben, I want to I wanna pick Ben. But I'm just talking about motivation, momentum, Sam Levine. Yeah, in an Iron Man match, that's interesting um, because there's a lot of ground to cover. I don't. I mean, I don't know if it's a 30 minute Iron Man match or what the duration is. I'm Make thinking it five minutes. hours. I would watch five hours with those guys. <laughs> uh, but I think over the long haul, I think I think we I think we could see like little spurts of people going on runs, like seven, eight question runs in a row, and then just like fall off for like four questions. So I think you might see a lot of up and down, but I think in the end, I think in the end, it's going to be Scott Mance. I really do. Wow, you think so? I do. Scotty Mance? I think because I don't in think an so. elongated form like that, he is more likely to hit more than he is to miss, and he's going to come across so many more films to, to show off that knowledge, because inst- as opposed to one or two questions a match, or if he gets a second round category, you know, he gets four questions. I think he's going to have so much more room to show his prowess that I don't think we've really seen anything from Scott Mance until we're, and we won't really fully know just how good he is in movie release dates. We know he's good, but I don't think we, know we he's really good. truly know until we see this match, and then we're going to, and then he's still going to wow us. I think they're all going to wow us, really, but he's going to wow us, and he's going to win, and he's going to be upset that his face, uh, Ben's, you know, the stipulation wasn't that he gets the slice. I think he's going to be mad about that, 
but that's because he won. So I don't know. We're gonna. I can't wait to. I can't wait to see it. I don't but know I if that's the stipulation either. I think I assumed that. I assumed yeah. that from the way the promo was cut. So I might be wrong on that. But even if it is, I think they should be. I think you know, make the exhibition mean something a little bit more than just you know, bragging rights. Yeah, like the All Star Game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So let's let's see what happens in it. But anyway, let's get into the matches that were this week because I think there's a lot to talk about. And I, I say we start off obviously with the first match that makes sense: McQueenie and Draco. Now, and Draco, you have a man who was one question away. He was a a Scott Con away from becoming the movie trivia showdown champion against William the Beast Bibiani. And then on the other side, you have Drew McQueenie, the Godfather, the man who never lost his championship, the man who was never defeated for his team championship, uh, Drew McQueenie. I think this was a really well-matched-up match. I, that, I was, you know, for lack of a better term, it was a well-matched-up match. I mean that because... You know, a lot of times in wrestling or in MMA or whatever, when I do commentary for wrestling, I always say, Styles makes fights, TP. That's what I always say. Styles makes fights. And I think that in this one, the style, in my opinion, is similar between these two guys. They don't have a a big, you know, verbose, big, huge personality when they come out. There's no, there's no Andrew Guy of it all. You know, there's no Ben Bateman. There's there's more of a, of a I'm aware of my talent. I'm super confident that I know a lot of movie trivia. And you kind of come out, and they're a little bit subtle with it. They have this subtle um, veneer of confidence that they come out with. But I, I feel like they have a similar, and, and you'd know better than me, but I think they have a similar disposition and also a similar um, knowledge base. I feel like they kind of are into a lot of the same things. Maybe Drew McQueenie a little bit more classics and stuff like that than 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 Andreco, but Andreco can hold his own in that. So I thought that they were evenly matched going in. Am I wrong in that assessment, Frank? I thought they were very evenly matched, and I can point to the stats and say and say that Andreco coming into the match was answering sixty nine percent, Drew McQueenie answering seventy one percent. So not that much of a discrepancy there. Uh, but with Andreco, I think we've talked about, talk about this in the past a lot, is he can be very up and down from match to match. You never know what you're really going to get with him. Drew McQueenie, he's generally pretty good. He's generally on the same level every time he's out there. It just depends who he's playing against. Uh, so knowledge-wise, though, I do agree that I think they're they're very similar in a lot of ways, and there's there, there wasn't going to be any glaring discrepancies between the two or differences between the two. So, yeah, I think this is one of the better matchups you could get for a first-round match. Again, it's in an eight-person field, so you're all you're already into uh, quarterfinals. If you right, will, right, right, 16. right. So this is where this match should have been if you were if you extrapolated and did all Here's that stuff. Here's the thing, right? though. I think that if they're on opposite sides of the bracket, it would not be inconceivable to this be your final. Like, oh, it correct. wouldn't be inconceivable. This could have been the final. You know, um, I, I think that they both have the juice to get there. So I love that it was a first round match. You know, this is a big one. Um, so let's talk about it. Let's get into round number one. Round number one, they ended in a dead heat, six to six. Um, they kind of even they they walked on the same questions. I think one was the Mark Rylance question in in round one, if I remember correctly. They both got that yeah. one wrong, and and then so they were very evenly matched. Like I said, this is kind of what I would have seen happening. Um, um, going into it. This is what I would have predicted happening. What did you think? What was your assessment around one? Yeah, it's fascinating to watch them both answer everything correctly, their, th- those questions that they both got correct, and then get their last two wrong um, pretty much in the right. same fashion. So right there, I told you, um, you know, we're in for a hell of a, hell of a match here between these two. Um, this is where the drama, though, heats up here in round number two. Um, let's go to Mark and Draco first. He um, he spun thrillers. Very interesting, thrillers. Um, we've seen this kind of this category to me, Frank, is still a, in my opinion, it's still a bit of a question mark. Because I, I I guess when it comes to the categorization of some of these films, I don't know how you do it. Like, what's the difference between action and adventure? I, I wish this is one of the times I wish Bibiani was here. Um, one of many times. I, I said that like I don't like him here. I'm one of many times that I wish Bibiani was here. I wish he was always here. Um, but he would be very good at explaining to me the differences. But thriller as its own category, do you think that it's a 
it, it's good to have it as a separate thing and not l- lumped in with thriller or with horror rather. Yeah, I do because I think uh, it, it because then you're kind of expect it's two categories really horror thriller. So then you're expecting well, it should be at least fifty fifty. I should get two horror, two thriller, and sometimes you would just get all thriller, or sometimes you get all horror, or you get one more than the other, and so it was a very unbalanced. And this way. I think with horror being a separate wheel category and thriller being a separate wheel category, um, it allows for a little bit more strategic gameplay, uh, depending who, who's you know in the match, right? And I think it, it lets the player know specifically, you know, they don't have to worry about horror questions if that's not if that's not their thing. They they want to worry about any horror questions coming up, right? So I think uh, I like I like both of these categories separated. Um, in the second round. I don't know why they don't do it in the first round, actually. <laughs> so Mark Andreco gets eight points out of a possible eight points in the thriller category, completely acing the board there. Um, exactly what you need to do, though. It's what you need to do in round number two. If everyone could get eight points every now, I mean, every time they played, obviously that would be ideal. But I think when you're going against somebody by Drew McQueenie, who you know has a, has a breadth of knowledge, who can get a very a lot of points very, very quickly, you know you are tied going into round number two. I got to rack up as many points as possible as a cushion, as a barrier, as a defense mechanism for Drew McQueenie because if he lands on something like classics or he lands on whatever, one of his 80s. main strengths, say again, or 80s, yeah, if he lands on anything like that, Man, I'm going to need to have some coverage here. And that's exactly what Mark Andreco did, getting all possible eight, putting the ball in Drew McQueenie's court. Um, did, did you think that normally when someone goes eight for eight, it's a very good sign that they might, and especially in a three-round match, they might go ahead and take the whole match. Did you think that the wins uh, uh, were, were in Mark Andreco's favor after he went eight for eight? Or eight, you know, eight possible points. Or did you think that Drew McQueenie was still in this, no matter what category you got? I certainly think it put some pressure on Drew to match that, considering they were tied after one round, right? So with right. Andreco getting all all eight possible points, that begs McQueenie to stay within that. If he misses one question, now he's at the at the very least going to be down by two if he gets his remaining three right. So. Uh, I thought it would. If you're going to go first in the second round, then you need to sweep the category. That's the best case scenario, obviously, in any situation. But especially when I think when you go first, because we know there's a lot of players out there that like to, like Sam Levine, likes to sit back, s- see what his opponent does, and then he knows what he has to do uh, in order to come out ahead or strategically place himself a certain way within the match. Uh, with Andreco, he went first. He got Thriller, stuck with it, got all eight. There's n- really no strategy involved in that besides wondering if he should take Thriller or not outside of that. So uh, he put himself in the best position possible, and he put some pressure on Drew. But as we saw with Drew, there's really not any category on that wheel that he really ultimately feared, it seemed like, because when he got actors and actresses, he was just like, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll take it. Whatever. And that's what he ended up getting actors and actresses and once again did pretty pretty good in it. <laughs> I would say so. Yeah. Round ends uh 14 to 13 Mark Andreco in the lead by 1 point. Um so this time uh Drew McQueen look, gets this yeah. this one this multiple choice one pointer that he ends up getting on the last question. He goes all 3 for 6 or the first 3 for 6. And he's one more to to keep to tie it with Andreco and to miss uh, uh, to to reduce down to multiple choice. That really that really stings uh, because he was right there with that Marmaduke question, if I remember correctly. Did did, uh, did, did you think? Are you saying? Wait, hold on. Are you saying that he shouldn't have gone multiple choice? He should have just gone for the two points. I'm saying it sucks that he felt like he had to go to multiple choice to get the one point because while while being only down one in this match isn't like the worst thing, but given how it's played, how the first round played out, how Mark was playing, man, like in a match this tight to go down by one, it's still kind of a big lead ish going to that final round. Cause you never know what can happen. I mean, yeah. And Drago could have went over three, but the way everything was playing out, when you just get that kind of feeling with how the match is going, it doesn't feel like they're all of a sudden going to start whiffing on questions left and right. Right. So, to go down to a multiple choice on that question was, uh, it was kind of it was kind of sucky to see, but it made for an exciting match. 
Oh, well, but I no, I agree, but at the same time, like, you know, I if I'm Drew McQueen, I'd rather get the one point than go for two and get it wrong yeah. and be down by two. I'm, I'm curious to see where, how close he was to even, if Owen Wilson was even in his mind or not. Um, that would shed a little more light on how I would feel about him going multiple choice overall, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, it's not like I don't understand where you're coming from. Just for me, it's like, well, if sure. I'm down, if I'm down one point going into round three, it, it's better than being down two points if I swing and miss because then when you get into round three, okay, if I get my two pointer right, we're tied. If he gets his two pointer, you know, wrong, then we're still tied. And then you know, I'm back in the game. You know what I mean? I, I don't know. I think it's just kind of. Oh no! If I got my two point, I would have been up one. I'm sorry. That's what I mean. Yeah, I mean in Rather the end, it really didn't matter. <laughs> yeah, in the end, it doesn't really matter that he went to multiple choice because the, the difference wasn't one point. Um, so, right, 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 right. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, let's get into though the round number three because round number three is where the, we we saw more drama added uh, because Drew goes first. His two pointer was in classics, according to. Humphrey Bogart at the end of Casablanca. Uh, what will he and Ingrid always have? And that was, of course, a classic line from the movie. Drew McQueenie. Perry. Is, yes. Drew McQueenie is very, very good in classics. We know this. This is something that he excels in. So uh, probably going to be an easy two points. He gets it. We go to Mark and Draco. Category is musicals and the greatest showman. And then I have Swear like I'm hearing Roka scream from somewhere. Uh, in The Greatest Showman, uh, who plays uh, Charity Barnum? So that was another two-pointer. Michelle Williams. Thank you for answering the question. <laughs> and now we're, we're back to Drew McQueenie. So let's talk about those real quick. I think these are both, you know, I think, uh, let's start doing this. Let's start talking about question difficulty. I think these are good two-pointers. Yeah. I thought the, actually the Casablanca one was a little more difficult just because I had to like really rack my brain for that one. Even though I've seen Casablanca a few times and I like that movie a lot, I still have to go back and think, well, what is it that they have? You kind of like think a little bit more about the... You have to think more on Drew's question than you did on Andrako's, I think, is what I'm trying to say. I feel you. I feel you. So let's get to the three-pointer. Three-pointer action adventure, the action adventure. The Raid series takes place in which country? I had no idea for this one. What was the answer? I believe it was Indonesia. I haven't seen the raid, so... Indonesia. Uh, but I think it was Indonesia. Lovely. Uh, the three-pointer was horror for Mark and Draco, and what was the last name of the paranormal investigating couple in The Conjuring? These are definitely three-point questions. Yeah. I'm going to say that very much so. I mean, I think that this three-pointer for horror could even borderline on a five-pointer. Mm, I don't... Mm, I... What is sure, the last name of the paranormal investigating couple in The Conjuring? I suppose. I mean, I guess you could just read that off of you know IMDb, you know yeah. what their character names are. But still, to me, that's kind of difficult. That's a deep pull. Um, and then the Raid series. I, I mean, I think that's a fair three. That's a fair three. So then we come to, or we're back at Mark and Draco, I believe. Correct. Yeah, because he misses the he misses the three. Because he misses stays. Yeah. Yes, he misses the three. So then we got stays with him. Tom Cruise was the f- five point question. Once again, I think Ben Bateman and Andrew Guy just screamed out. <laughs> Who plays Rowdy Burns in Days of Thunder? He gets the question correct, and the answer was Michael Rooker. Thank you, sir. Uh, Michael Rooker was also in that movie, The Sixth Day, with Arnold Schwarzenegger that I watched recently, and Michael Rapaport, who's a Collider favorite. Um, what a weird movie. It's about cloning people. Because hmm. they cloned a sheep. You remember when they cloned the sheep in the 90s? Yeah. Was it uh, Sally? I don't know. What was this? Dolly. Name? I think it was Dolly. Dolly. Something like that. Yeah. You think that... Whatever happened to Dolly? Do we know what happened to Dolly? She's, I think she's in a home somewhere. Is Dolly in a home? Does she live yeah. that long? Because she'd oh, be yeah. 21 right now. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, sheep live for, you know, eons. Like tortoises. Do they really? Or no, you're 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 completely. Be frank with me, Frank. <laughs> you be frank. I'll be Dean. No, tell me. Do you know anything about sheep at all? <laughs> I know plenty of sheep. I see a lot of the, their commercials right now going on, and uh, yeah. Okay, I, I'm not. I know that this is definitely not what people tune in to the Schmodown yeah, Rundown yeah. for, but I have to see what's the life expectancy of sheep. 
I have to know because I can't go on with my life without knowing this. And I know people right now, as I'm trying to find this answer, are thinking, I don't know. What is the lifespan? No, achievement? someone Remember? probably actually knows. And they're like, it's 17 years, you idiots. Yeah, like, it's actually <laughs> 10 to 12 years 10 to 12, is okay. how long a sheep uh, is expected to last. That's the lifespan of a sheep. Now I don't know if Dolly was a sheep or a goat. <laughs> Which one was it? I don't remember. Well, goats live for 18 years, so it, just in case you wanted to know. So she could theoretically not be alive, but it's probably it's probably a safe bet. Anyway, Michael Rooker was the answer to that question. You- As we move on. <laughs> Guys, I'm telling you, it's been a very long holiday week. I've, I've overworked. As we move on, we get to the five-point question for Drew McQueenie. Biopics. This which is, is, is this not a strength of his? Uh, I, I, well, Apollo 13 isn't. Uh, if Biopix is, sure, but Apollo 13 seems to not be uh, a strength of his. Uh, this it, question... It was, well, Apollo 13 was, what was the flight surgeon concerned uh, would come, uh, Mattingly would come down with dashing his hopes of joining the mission? It was the measles. He was, they were afraid. So, I mean, it's, it's curious. I love this movie, so it was a really easy question for me. But there's a scene in this movie where all three of them are in a... Qu- it was a... Uh, we call it Bill Paxton, Tom Hanks, mm-hmm. and... And uh, we call it... What's his... Oh, jeez, I can't even think of his name right now. Oh, Ed Harris? Uh, no, not Ed Harris. Wow, I, uh, I can see his face. Uh, Lieutenant Dan. I can't, why can't I think of his real name? Oh, I don't know his name. Gary Sinise. There it is. Oh, there you go. There it is, Gary Sinise. And they're all sitting in a circle, and... He, the way the scene ends is that he's like, he stands up and tells both of them, he's like, I don't have the measles. I'm not going to get the measles. And that's the end of the scene. So I thought for sure, like, that was a pretty nice five, five pointer to get, but he lost on it. And, and that's just, you know, how this game goes sometimes. I prefer Space Cowboys. Um, but that is the end of the re- match. Drew McQueenie falls to the Android Mark and Draco and Draco moves forward in the bracket into the I guess it's the semifinals technically moves into the semifinals is that right yeah yeah the semi yeah right yeah moves into the semifinals and we we'll, we will see what happens there and we'll get to the man who um now wait how does the bracket play out who does who does Drew McQueenie I mean who does Mark and Draco face Mark and Draco is going to end up facing the winner of Ben Bateman and Clark Wolf. Right. So this is on the left. Dun, dun, the dun. Dun, da, da, dun. So we will see how that plays out. Now, let's before we get to the second match, and hard-fought effort, obviously, by both men. Final score, I believe, was 21-18. to 18. Mark and Draco wins on the right path, on the, on the winning path back to the championship. He's got a shot. He's got a shot to get. Has anyone ever had two championship shots in one year uh, at the singles title? At the singles title? Yeah. Uh, I guess you could say Roca back in 2016 because he beat Merle and then he, then he, I guess you could say, weaseled his way into that triple threat match at Collision. So that's two shots at the belt, even okay. though he lost it to Riley before that. So you could, you could say that. Other than that, okay. I'm trying to think if anybody else. Um, I can't think of anyone else on the top of my head. Yeah. Who got two shots in one e- in like one season, I should <laughs> right, say. Right, yeah, yeah. In one season. So um Mark Andreco could be the second man to do it. Uh he advances into the semifinals. Now before we get to Chance versus Irwin, because I have a lot to say about this match. Real quick, Frank. They yeah. talked about it on Collider Live. Just tell me. You're not down for the Back to the Future reboot. You know, as we're listening to them a little bit, you know, I think the the, the 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 definition of reboot and sequel needs like some defined parameters because a sequel is a, a, a film that comes out maybe two, three, four years later, whereas a reboot's like it's been fifteen years or twenty years or thirty years later, like a reboot. So the way Christian was describing it. It depends who's on board, who's attached to all of that. Like if, like if it's just, if I have no confidence in the people who are producing or directing or, or starring in it, then that could help me sway. That could help sway my opinion on it. But I wouldn't. I, I'm not asking for this. I'm not clamoring for it. I'm not one of these people that's saying I would love to see a Back to the Future remake or a reboot. Uh, if it happens, 
it happens, and then I have to see who's involved, and then then I can make a better determination. But this is not something I'm looking for, you know. Yeah, I think I think if if we got it, I wouldn't mind it. And me, I'm like the biggest Back to the Future fan in the world. I'm staring at sh- my shelf in front of me that has all my Back to the Future memorabilia on it. I'll post a picture on the Twitter at Brad Gilmore. But um, I think that if they do it, they do it. I'll watch it, and if I enjoy it, I accept it. If I, I don't, tell you, it doesn't exist. I tell you what, if they do it, it it better be better than any of the three. It has to be better than one of them. It has to be. It can't be the fourth best one of four. It better be better than two or three. That's depending a, a on depending bar. depending depending on how which one you put above one another. Because I know yeah. a lot of people like three, a lot of people like two, but I think I'm back on the you know three train. I think three. I think is, so. Is better I think than two. two. I think yeah, so too. Yeah. I'm yeah. definitely on back on three. Um, I also think that train. To, I to, did there too. <laughs> yeah, I think that a reboot. I, here's a better example because I know Christian gave uh, the Force Awakens as a reboot. I think that's a sequel. <laughs> I think that's a sequel. I think a reboot is but like I, I a reboot. Like point- here's here's the thing though: a reboot is not a remake of a film, right? So it's a it's a, always a different story in a reboot, right? I think that a reboot is whenever they change uh, the guy who plays Bond. So going from Pierce Brosnan in Die Another Day to Daniel Craig in Casino Royale, that to me is a reboot because you're changing the character. You're changing the guy who plays the character, kind of the style of the franchise, but still moving forward with an additional installment in the franchise. To me, that's a reboot. Hmm. That's interesting because that kind of that kind of conflicts with my own personal definition of a reboot, where it's a sequel takes place. Well, I'm going off the Oxford definition, of course. Uh, oh, no. um, yeah. oh, Oxford. Oh, yes. well. Hmm. The Webster uh, Merriam or Merriam Webster. Merriam. Yeah. Yeah. What's your personal I, I definition? Liked- well, of 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 a, of a reboot would be a movie in a in a franchise that's now being made ten years after the last one was made. A sequel has to take place within the next five years. Five uh, the years. Last five years within like it comes out within five years. But at the same time, Christian's point was that a sequel is a direct continuation of what just happened in the first one, whereas a Force Awakens wasn't really a continuation of what happened after Return of the Jedi. There's a lot that happened in between that we didn't see, so therefore it's a... I see his point as it being a reboot, but chronologically, if you go from 6 to 7, then it then it really shouts at you as a sequel. But technically it is. I can see it as a reboot as well. Star Wars is a weird is a weird thing. Like, Does that make the prequel trilogy a reboot? See, that's yeah. It's interesting though because they call it a prequel, but not a reboot of the franchise. Because you, you, that is interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it is what it's a prequel trilogy, whatever it is. But on the the point of the reboot, you get more stories out of the Back to the Future stuff. So, as if you get more, if you get them going to the Revolutionary War or something in the reboot, that would be something completely different and awesome. So, I mean, as long as they do it right, you guys have really nothing to lose, only to gain. And if they do it yeah, at that point, you have the label skull. doesn't matter what yeah. it is yeah it, yeah if they do it bad i'm just going to treat it like ghostbusters the 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 new one that came out like 2 years ago that is a garbage film i don't know if y'all saw that movie i have not it's complete garbage it is a trash can of 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 dumb um okay. horrible 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 awful um anyway sorry now let's move on to our next match from this week let's talk about Ethan Irwin versus Chance Ellison. Frank, we spent some time talking about this last week. We said that this was a a very, I thought on paper, a very interesting match. I believe you gave the edge to Ethan, correct? I did. I did yeah. because, you know, Chance, he's only been in teams and he performed well in teams. But Ethan, you know, he not only does he have age over... Uh, chance, but he's been in some pretty big matches already in the singles division. He's played solo, um, and you look at his accuracy rate coming into the match, the 83% chance in teams and individual questions between rounds one and three. That's how I um, define that. Um, he was answering 74%. So, like, he's no slouch, but Ethan is just on a different level than this kid, literally, and it, I always saw it going Ethan's way, but 
I would not have been surprised if Chance pulled it off because Ethan has shown some weaknesses and they kind of show up here a little bit in this match with him. So it's not like he's in, like Ethan has a loss on his record, so he can be beat. I just thought, I just thought it was gonna be a tall order for Chance, um, but you know he, I think he really did prove a lot of people wrong. If he had any doubters out there, um, just how well he can play in this league despite his age. Because, I mean, let's face it, that is a factor. It, it is. You just can't ignore that. Right, right. Absolutely. And and that's kind of the same reasons I had of why I saw um, uh, uh, Ethan Irwin being a, I would say, you know, favorite. A, I, I, I don't even say a slight favorite. I would say a, a pretty solid, you know, yeah. minus 250, minus 350 favorite. That's not a disrespect match. to Chance either, by the way. No, 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 no. Obviously not. I think that Chance, Chance is really what I want to talk about, in my opinion, because Chance, to me, is the story of this match. Hmm. In my opinion. Sure. In my opinion, Chance Ellison, this time next year, will either be in the middle or would have already had a singles championship reign. I think, I think he wins the title next year. I almost think it's a foregone conclusion. What that guy we've said me, that before about people, and, and it's I'm taken always right. Years, <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm always right. As long as you switch your prediction from week to week, you can never be wrong in the end. Hey, as long as I bet, I'm one of those guys who, when I go to the roulette table, I, I bet on every single number. You bet on red and black, <laughs> just red and black, <laughs> double zero zero. I put it on every single number, like one penny chips on every single number. Congratulations, sir! You won two cents. I guarantee a winner, brother. Guarantee a winner. That's all I care about. Who you trying to get the hut though, Mo? So, um, I think that Chance Ellison was so impressive in this match. I guess because I expected great play from Ethan, I assumed that he was going to give me top-notch, high-caliber play. I didn't know in a single setting against somebody the caliber of Ethan Irwin if Chance Ellison was going to rise to the occasion. And he did. He definitely did. To me, this was to me, this was a lot like Rocky One. You know, Creed is out this weekend. Creed two, I haven't seen it yet. Frank, I don't think you've seen it yet. Not yet. But this reminds me of Rocky One. This is Ethan Irwin is Apollo Creed. He's given the Italian stallion a chance, no pun intended, to go out there and prove himself to the world. And to me, chance absolutely did. So let's talk about it. Round number one. Six to five is how it ends. Ethan Irwin up. Anything stick out to you about round one? Yeah, uh, Ethan Irwin. Ethan Irwin. He misses on animated, and bum bum Chance, bum shocker. And Chance gets it right, but then in the eighties was a was it Footloose question? Um, Ethan Irwin gets it right. Chance gets it wrong. So you can already in you can point to this little two question section as. Uh, the battle of age right there. You know, perhaps Ethan, although before this match, animated wasn't something that he's particularly uh, strong in, but with Chance, you know, he as we saw in round two with Pixar, uh, I think clearly knows his animated as well as Pixar. So, and then you get into 80s, that's going to be a little bit more tougher for Chance because he literally has to go back like 15 years before he was born and watch movies that, or study movies that uh, he wasn't around for. So uh, it was interesting to see it, but Chance getting five points is is an average is an average play here in the in the singles league. Ethan Irwin with six. Uh, that's usually it's actually kind of right around his average. He's six or seven uh, points for him. So um, I thought Ethan would get in that seven point range, but six nonetheless is good enough to have a one point lead over Chance. Yeah, I mean five points isn't blowing anybody's socks off here. But I, I definitely think that six to five going into round two, Chance got to feel like he's got an opportunity. Oh yeah, I didn't want to say Chance there. Um, <laughs> talk to me though. How old? Do we know how old Chance Ellison? He's twenty-one. Is? You know, he just turned twenty-one. Yeah. So I think twenty that twenty-one. Yeah. That's definitely something he's going to have to study up on a little bit more. Or those older films. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not that much older than. I'm him, sure he's seen the movie. Just couldn't pull the answer. I know, but I feel like haven't we? Didn't we see this in some of the team play when when the movies would go a little bit further back than you know last thirty years? There might be a little bit of trepidation on Chance's part, you know. Of mm, I don't really know. I mean, twenty one. That means you're like nineteen ninety eight, nineteen ninety nine, nineteen ninety seven. You know what I mean? 
Jesus. Every good movie ever made was already made by then. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot of catching up to do, brother. Uh, every good film ever was made. It's fun for me to have somebody younger than me in the space, too. You know what I mean? That's, I don't want to be the youngest guy always. Um, so I appreciate you, Chance Ellison. But going six to five, I think that you got to feel you know pretty decent going in there. Now round number two. Brother. Mm. Brother. Yeah. So good. So good. This round was so good. Uh, we go to Ethan Irwin. He is like a hair away. Just a, a small amount of inertia away from getting Spinner's Choice. Oh. Lands know, was, it a, was it opponents or Spinner's? No, it was Spinner's. I okay. think it was Spinner's Choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very close to getting Spinner's Choice. Um, now you have me second guessing. Yes, it was Spinner's yeah. Choice. Okay. Wasn't it? I believe if you say so. Uh, we'll hear about it in the comments how wrong we are or are not. <laughs> That's all I've heard this week is how much of an idiot that I am. So it doesn't shock me. You know, add Brad <laughs> Gilmore, by the way. It doesn't shock me that I'm going to get any Send more all of that. insults there. Yeah. Send them to me. I've gotten them all week, by the way. You know, shout out to those wrestling people, brother. But um, I, uh, I, I saw him get spy movies. I always like when this category comes up because I know I'm going to get a little James Bond action in there. And we did. But I didn't think that Ethan Irwin would take it, but he did. Um, was this a shocker for you? Spy movies seems to be a category that unless you're Mike Kalinowski and a handful of others, you kind of like to gingerly spin away from. Ethan Irwin sticks with it. Does he have, um, you're the stat man, you know the categories. Does he have any prior success in this category? Is there any indicators that he'd be a uh, very good or above average player in this category? Whole transcription because I I want to say yes but I don't know for sure because um, I know he did land on it but I think he might have passed it up. Uh, I'm looking back at well, again. Why you why you look at that? I okay, do so say, actually oh, he did ahead. he did pass it up once. He passed up spy in the um, Lon Harris match, which um, he came out on top twenty four to twenty it was a really high scoring match. Uh, but he skipped spy and ended up on thriller. So he's passed it up once before. Interesting. So I wonder why that category was attractive to him. I don't really know. I would have liked to ask him, hey, Ethan, what up, dog? I wonder why he chose that one. Or do, you have any, do you have any guesses, Frank? Because, we had, like I said, if he's passed on it before, maybe he thought, well, enough people have passed on this for quite some time. Maybe he'll have some, you know, cher- I, maybe I can cherry pick some of these questions a little bit. Maybe it'll be surface level. I don't know. What do, what do you think? I don't understand the mentality there. Maybe he did see Pixar on that wheel and said, if I get that, that could be donezo, you know, for I'm, me. I'm it, yeah. I, know, I would rather it. take my chances Yeah. and get a weird man from uncle question than, you know, four movies about Cars 3. I mean, four <laughs> questions about Cars 3 and right. it's a bug life and whatever else is in Pixar, the good dinosaur, you know, you really could have, he, he really could have screwed the pooch there. So that is a good, that is a good point. Um, but he does it phenomenally. As we said, getting every question correct. Um, what a, what a, what a round from Ethan Irwin. When I saw him do this in a category that I was unsure that if he was talented at all in, when I saw him do this, Ooh, brother, that I think that he's going to be a major problem. If he were to get, if he were to get a W here, I was thinking, This man's going to be a major problem in this tournament. And um, we'll find out what happens in the third round. But great, great play. And then Chance Ellison. He gets Spinner's Choice. Uh, It almost came Ethan Irwin's way. It went Chance Ellison's way. He, of course, immediately goes to Pixar because every Pixar movie has been made during his lifespan. Actually, that's not (laughs) true. There were some before then. One Toy Story, like, 95? 94? Something like that. 95? Something like that. So... He goes, though, all eight points in Pixar and, and gets us 14 to 13. He even he knew some of these ones that were just, what was the It's a Bug's Life question? I don't I don't remember off the top of my head. But yeah, was, I think David Hyde Pierce was some character. Some talking stick but or yeah, something like that. Yeah, even Christian was like, what in the world? Like, this kid, he knows, like, the stuff that he knows, he knows, he knows, he knows it. You know? He knows it backwards, forwards, up, down, twice on Sunday, the whole nine yards. He yeah. knows the category wholly, always, when it comes to something like a Pixar. But, you know, once again, if he spreads his wings a little bit. Well, well, real quick, though, about this, 
this could be a huge. If we look at next season, though, this could be a huge advantage for him because, as we've seen throughout the history of the Shmodown, not as it just animated, but like as well as Pixar, not a lot of players are that skilled in in this category. So that could be a huge advantage for him down the road. Um, while it didn't play to his advantage here, just because of the way things align and you're playing against Ethan Irwin, you're going to need a couple more breaks against a guy like that sometimes. Um, this could very well be a huge feather in his cap next year against a lot of other players. Oh, absolutely. This could be this could be one of the categories that when he gets, it, it, it could be lights out, round over. And now um, people know. Now people know about Pixar and Chance. So that's and that's something really good to have in your back pocket if if you're a young player, uh, literally like Chance. <laughs> yes, young Sorry. player, literally <laughs> like Sir Ellison, who's going to be the champion next year. Now we get to round number three. Round number three it had the same score, uh, fourteen to thirteen, as our Mark and Draco Drew McQueenie match. We get into it. And let's talk about it here, Frank, because Chance had a real opportunity to knock out Ethan Irwin. Chance with his two-pointer, though. You know, knock him out of the tournament, not knock him out. Uh, Chance's two-pointer was war. What is that good for? Absolutely nothing. Now, is that, are you making a Seinfeld reference, or is you're making the song reference? You know, I haven't decided. I don't know yet. We'll, we'll find out at the end of this episode. You could go either way. Yeah, you, you know? could. Um, so anyway, War, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Who directed Thin Red Line? Chance gets that question correct. And it was, of course, Frank. Uh, Terrence Malick. Terrence Malick. We <laughs> go to Ethan Irwin, who gets Scorsese. And what marked Gregory Peck's final film role? He gets it correct, which, of course, Frank was. It, You know, that one. It, it was that... Uh, shoot. Why don't... Uh, I just watched this match. Why can't Draw it a blank. It doesn't matter. We go to Chance Ellison's three-pointer, which was Kate Blanchett. Blanchett won an Oscar for which Woody Allen film? Blue Jasmine was the answer, which was... Wait, wait. You got to uh, say it like Chance does. You got to go, Blue Jasmine. Blue, ja- Blue Jasmine. <laughs> yes. I do. He's a very serious man. I know. He's a very serious man. Blue Jasmine. Blue Jasmine. <laughs> um, which, by the way, did you see A Star is Born? I did. I did. Yeah. Andrew did. Dice Clay in both of these films. Love, An- love Dice. Wait, that's right. That's right. I forgot he was. I I knew that he was in it, but I didn't know. Well, I I knew after the fact, and then I was like, "What? That was him? I didn't know he's Lady Gaga's dead." Hey, man, that's like me. Uh, what was what was Homeboy's name? The general in Rogue One, who was the CGI? Oh, Tarkin. Yeah, General Tarkin. Well, who's who's he played? Who's Grand Moff Tarkin. That's why I didn't recognize. What oh, trying Grand Moff. Tar- oh, sorry. <laughs> It's Grand Moss Tarkin. Yeah, it's yeah. not General. That's General Leia Organa. Um, there you go. But anyway, I didn't know uh, Peter something or another. Um, I thought that he was. I thought that was him. I didn't know that it was CG. Peter something or other. Yeah, Peter something or another. Brother, I'm telling you, I had too much turkey. I think I have poisoning. I have urobiotic oh poisoning, and I could oh. die. Um, we go. <laughs> We go on, yeah, Peter Cushing, that's right. I thought he was still alive when I saw Rogue One. I'm like, God, he looks great Peter for his age. something or other, yeah, was, yeah. He looked great for his age. He did. And I found out afterward that he was a CGI. Oh, uh, I was goodness. like, because this guy looked 80 in the 70s. And oh, he looks my great. gosh. Um, see, I'm an idiot. It's fine. That, I, I think all the Twitter in. hate that I've gotten this week is apropos. Um, we go on to Ethan Irwin's three-pointer. Val Kilmer plays a master of disguise. In what spy movie? The answer was The Saint. Starring Drew and then, Yes. And then we move on to the five-pointer. And Frank, do you remember the five-point question? I do. Well, why don't you read it? <laughs> you want me to read it? I do. What late singer did Brad Pitt idolize in Johnny Swade. And was it was answer? Ricky Nelson. Yes. Richie, is it Richie Nelson or Ricky Nelson? It's Ricky Nelson. Ricky Nelson, yeah. Yeah. Ricky Nelson, of course. He sang Garden Party, um, as, as well as Poor Little Fool. Poor Little Fool by Ricky Nelson was the very first song to top the Billboard Hot 100. I don't know if you knew that, but I just... Drops some know knowledge that. on you. Yeah, yes. But he got that answer incorrect, so it doesn't matter anyway. Yeah. Uh, he lost on the question. The round ends 19 to 18. Ethan Irwin doesn't have you to mean, go to his five. You mean the game ends 19 to 18, not the, yes, I mean, the, the round? Yes, the game does, ends. But... The match ends yeah. uh, 19 to 18. Ethan Irwin 
takes the victory and doesn't even have to go to his five. And holy hell, do I think that Ethan Irwin's got legs, man. I think he, he could go all the way. He could. And it's going to be curious to see because I... I coming into this, I was curious about his experience in terms of big match, big matches, and how he might fare under the lights and in that kind of pressure. But you know, Chance, I'm not is not like one of the the mainstays that the league has seen, like a Dan Merle, like Dan Merle or Clark Wolf or even Andrako, right? Um, to this point, so it's it was good to see Ethan play this way which leads me to believe that it really just doesn't matter he's just up there and he's all he, all he cares about is what's the question I'm gonna answer it and and that's all there is to it I, I don't know how much strategy he really needs if he can play like this I think um, because he's so good in round two. It doesn't really matter what kind of strategy he <laughs> right. tries to employ because he literally answers them all. I think I said in the stats segment he's only missed like three round two questions in the for the entire year, for the entire year. So it's incredible. It's insane what he can do in the second round, and that's incredible. where a lot of these games are won or lost for a lot of players, and that's really no weakness. That's probably the strongest part of his game is round two, and, and that's a dangerous thing for everybody else. Absolutely, I think he's. I think he, you know what? He might be my pick. You know what I mean? Gee, he might here be we my go. Pick. Here we go. He might be my pick. Did man. you I just might... say it was me and Draco? He can. Did you just say that? I said he's got. He, you know, he's got an opportunity. <laughs> okay. You know? I say he's, he's got an opportunity. Pick. He's in the tournament. Yeah, he's got an opportunity. He's in. The... <laughs> he's got an opportunity to do it. <laughs> I'm picking my pick. Is yeah. Ben Bateman? Um. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. They're all one. Oh, They're all one. Yeah. Guys, this has been a long week for all of us. We've had holiday. I've already put on about six pounds. I've watched mm-hmm. Home Alone one and two. Uh, I've really settled into this week. Had a break for this Saturday. But let's talk about one thing, Frank Janish, before we wrap this up. Thanksgiving has already passed. But let's talk about what we are thankful for in terms of the movie Trivia Schmodown. One thing. I'm going to pass it around. I'm going to start with Chris Clark. Chris, what are you thankful for in the terms of the movie Trivia Schmoda? Honestly, I'm thankful for the entire community that Christian has kind of put together, the friendships I've made, the people I consider family that aren't blood. You guys, uh, the friendships I've made with... Obviously, we're not the family that's not blood, Frank, but continue. I would... I, I said that you, I said I you guys, oh no, I met you guys I met uh, everybody at Take Three, uh, the friendships I made with w- the Beast Bibiani, Whitney Seibold, Robert Meyer, Burnett, everybody, the trust that I have with the Collider crew, I have a lot of passwords, uh, I, 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 <laughs> I have okay. a lot of power, <laughs> yeah, uh, but they they give me a lot of uh, they, they they've given me a lot of trust, so I, I'm thankful for all of that and, and how they they brought me into the. The fold. So I'm thankful for the entire community that Christian has created. It's been a blessing, and I can't wait to rock it for the future. Hey, can somebody out there who's talented with Photoshop, whether it be Brian Ward or somebody else, can somebody Photoshop Chris on a computer that says they give me a lot of passwords or I, I have, have a lot of a passwords. Lot of passwords. I have a lot of passwords. I want that on a somebody... hat, on a shirt, on a bag. Oh, my goodness. I <laughs> have a lot of passwords. It's amazing. It needs to be everywhere oh my goodness do i love it frank what what are you thankful for well you know can you name that this that's the name of this episode by the way i have a lot of passwords but continue, I have a lot of passwords, yeah uh yeah i'm really thankful for both of you guys really um, hey and because you guys have really made this year very very enjoyable uh, i'm not gonna get into everything else but with brad coming on board and then especially with chris helping us Go to video and the graphics and everything he does to get the show ready, you know, um, and put it up on YouTube and Podcast One and, and all that stuff. You know, it's you know it's an immense um, privilege to work with you, Chris and Brad. You know, you've brought a different different type of energy, a good energy, and I enjoy uh, our, our banter back and forth. Even though you piss me off every single freaking no, you don't, but. You know, it's a lot of fun um, talking showdown with you, and I'm just really thankful th- thankful that uh, this season so far 
has been one of the best, not just for the Schmodown, but for this show. Uh, I've had a lot of fun doing it, and we've done a lot of cool things, and that's that doesn't happen without you two guys. I'm going to echo all your same sentiments, both of you. I'm just going to say ditto. But the thing that I am most thankful for is January the 26th. The Schmodown will be live in New York City, New York, Brooklyn, the BK, home of the greatest rapper alive, J to the Z, baby. And we will see you there. Get your tickets now, SchmodownLive.com. You're going to have to work off that holiday wait, and you're going to have to look in great shape when you show up live and in living color because the cameras are going to be rolling. It's going to be a massive, massive match. The winner at Schmodown Spectacular. Who's going to be the champion? Whoever it is, they're going to open the season next year, January the 26th. SchmodownLive.com. Get your tickets for Frank Janish at FrankieJ29. For Chris Clark, 8788. Those numbers mean nothing. I am Brad Gilmore. I have none of the passwords, but you can follow me on Twitter at Brad Gilmore. We will see you on this very show next week.